So as we gather this morning, I have to be truthful with you, and I ask the Lord, why? Why this word for this house? Because I feel the word that I'm actually bringing is something that this house carries. But how many of you know, you know, when you carry something, that actually positions you for the more. And so I want you to understand that as you listen to this, open up your hearts, open up your minds to hear not from a little old lady, but from the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, only let me say today what you want me to say. Lord, don't let fear or, or anything, any people pleasing get in the way. Lord, let me deliver what you want me to say. Father, we open up our hearts to hear from you. You know what each one needs to hear from this message today. Father, let me say everything as you would in absolute love. In absolute love because you are the lover of our souls. And we worship you and honour you in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well... How many of you know if you you know if you're one of these prophetic people and you're sort of looking at what God is doing at the moment over my lifetime I have seen God do this amazing restoration bringing pieces back into the church that we lost you know he brought back gifts of the spirit they were lost for years he brought back the apostolic he brought back um, deliverance all of a sudden now churches are embracing deliverance Jesus did it quarter of his ministry um, but we lost it suddenly all of these things are coming back and now even communion you know how many of you know at the moment there's just a revival in people actually taking their own communion with the Lord and that's what God does he's bringing everything back but also also what he's doing he's actually refocusing our hearts he is right at the moment refocusing our hearts and I was looking through some of the really, really old devotional books from like 50 years ago. And you know what? I, I realised they were quite different from our devotionals today. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, there are some things here that you lost and I need my body to pick them up again. I need them to pick up these things again. And then I was listening to um, an interview with Heidi Baker because the message that I'm bringing is something that God has been speaking to me for my own life over and over again over the last few months, probably the year. And I was listening to a message, an interview with Heidi Baker. And those of you may, who you don't know Heidi Baker, she um, looks after hundreds, literally hundreds of orphans in Mozambique. But what she's known for is the miraculous. There are phenomenal miracles that happen and literally hundreds being raised from the dead under this ministry. And I was listening to her as she was saying that dead babies, mums would bring these dead babies, and she has these little old ladies that no one knows, and she gives them the dead baby, and they go off. They fast, they pray, they just disappear into the, you know, into the shack or wherever they live you know, on their own for, for days. And then they come back and the baby's alive. The baby's alive. This is true. This is not fairy stories. This is true. And it started to ignite my heart. Then the interviewer asked Heidi Baker, what, what's the key then to this level of ministry? And she said these words that resonate over and over in my heart. Lower still. Lower still. And what I want to talk to you today is about that lower still. Because humility qualifies us to carry the more. Humility is what qualifies us for the greater grace. We're told in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Right? He gives us all grace, but there is a grace reserved for the humble that will enable the miraculous. It will enable the miraculous. So I want to start with my most favourite passage in Scripture. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Philippians 2, 3 to 9. Be, be free from pride, filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart, but in authentic humility, put others first 
and view others as more important than yourself. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Oh, Lord, may we never, ever lose sight that that's the example that we are to follow. You see, we serve a God that chose to enter the world being put in a food trough for animals. He chose that. He ended his life dying, choosing to die, a criminal's death that was reserved for the vilest, the vilest of criminals. That's what he chose. What does that tell me? It tells me that humility has got to define my entire life. We can never, ever lose sight that it's got to define it. We never outgrow it. We never outgrow it. We actually have to, as we grow, we should go deeper and deeper into that place. Prior to his death, you know, I was reading this the other day. He didn't just wash his disciples' feet. He takes off his outer garment. Now, in the culture of the day, the lowest of the lowest slaves wash feet. But the lowest of the lowest of the lowest slaves didn't even have clothes to wear. Where they just wore a loincloth. He strips down to that and he washes feet. That's the saviour of the world. That's the Lamb of God. We can never get past these truths because that's what's got to define us. Because then he rose in glory and in all authority. Right? But then what does he do? It's just mind-boggling. He says greater things. I want you to do the greater things. Hang on a minute. What? You want us to do greater than what Jesus did on earth? Yes, because he's not insecure. What about us when others are promoted? What about us? What do we feel when others get the promotion that we feel we deserve? Just remember that Jesus, all-powerful, almighty Jesus, wanted you to do greater things. Blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. And those of you who know me and have heard me preach before know that I am a great believer in the authority and the power that we carry. Right? I, I believe that with all my heart and I want every person here to exercise that. However, the power and the influence that you carry, the power and the gifting that you carry, it God has reserved it to be used for others. It is actually reserved and given to us so that we can see others set free. You know, Jesus, Satan came to Jesus and tempted him. And he said, you're the son of God. Turn these stones into bread because he knew Jesus was hungry. Jesus refused to do that because he refused to use his authority to benefit himself in any way, shape or form. And I think God is saying, guys, I've given you authority. I've given you incredible power and position. Remember what it's for. It's to benefit others. You know, I remember David, and we know the story of David. David was a man after God's own heart. He had been, he had been, um, it had been prophesied that he would be king. He had been anointed to be king, but he would not take out Saul when he had the opportunity on more than one occasion. Why? Because self-promotion is not God's way. It is not God's way. Run away from it. Don't touch it. It's poison. It's absolute poison. You know, we're given this incredible power and authority inside of us 
to make a difference to a hurting world. It is not for our ministry. It is not for me to feel better. It's not for me to build my sense of self-worth or importance, right? It is to bring others what they cannot get themselves. Do you understand you've got the power inside of you to release to someone else what they can never get themselves until they know Jesus? That's what we're given the authority for. And when you get breakthrough and favour, whether it's in the business world, whether it's in sport, whether it's in music, whether it's in ministry, whatever it is, it's very easy to see it's something that I've worked hard for. Because all of us know that to get, you know, get anywhere, hard work is involved. You know, hard work is involved. A number of you are businessmen in this room and businesswomen. Hard work is involved. But never forget, never forget who gave you the success. Never forget who gave you the ability. Never forget it. Never forget it. Don't let entitlement creep in. Don't let, you know, it's, it, you did not earn it. I didn't earn it. It was given to you as a gift. Every dollar you've got and you earned it and you worked hard for. And I feel the Holy Spirit is pushing me to say this. You worked hard for it, but none of it is yours. None of it. Forget the 10%. None of it is yours. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we would have nothing. But he gives us everything. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Oh, he's such a good God. He's such a good God. And the more favour, the more humility. You know, and I hear a lot of young ones, and I love hanging around young people because they give me that life, that sense of life. In the, and, you know, numbers of them, they've got this vision to reach the world, to reach the lost, you know, to touch the entertainment industry, to do this, and that's fantastic. But my question to them all is, you know what? Are you prepared to pray for God to use someone else to do that with the same fervency that you want him to use you? Because that's the acid test right there. That's the acid test. You know, I've got a beautiful granddaughter. Some of you know she came to Bangladesh with me, with, with some of you guys. And she started this amazing blog and it's doing really well. It's called, you know, it's about really, um, you know, bringing the gospel to, to young women. And uh, we, we were talking, my other daughter who's with me, Liz, my beautiful daughter's with me today. Sorry, I forgot to introduce her. Uh, but she was talking to... Ariella about, about the blog and, and Ariella was asking because she's now in this space of understanding what humility is and how important it is. And, um, you know, we were talking, Liz and I, and I said this, you know, if God asked you to give that blog and hand it over to someone else and then it blew up and went viral, how would you feel? How would you feel then? Because that's the test of our heart. It's not about us. It's about extending his kingdom. And we say that stuff, but what we feel on the inside is what we've got to gauge. That's what we've got to gauge, you know, and we can get caught up, so caught up in our own assignment. I know that I do at different times. We get so caught up and see what I'm doing right now, what God's called me to do is the most important, you know. But then you can miss the need right in front of you. You can miss the God assignment right in front of you. Those of you who are mums and dads, you know when you're caught up and you've got you know, something on your mind that's really important and whatever, you can miss the look in your son or your daughter's eyes which says, Mum, I need you now. Dad, I need something from you now. We can miss those things so easily and so quickly because we believe the lie that what we're focusing on is the most important. No, it isn't. It's what Jesus is focusing on. And, and my prayer is that God align me and my eyes with your eyes so I can see what is the important thing. And I'm remembered of um, Lisa Bevere, those of you who know John and Lisa Bevere, they're worldwide ministers. But years ago, she was ministering at a church I was on staff at and um, and we had organised a, a lunch for her in her honour. And she'd ministered and then she was being driven by the driver to the lunch. We're all at the lunch. 45 minutes goes past. There's, they haven't arrived. Like, where is Lisa? Where's the driver? What's happening? Anyway, then she comes in. 
And she says nothing. She just apologizes and sits down. But the driver tells us that as they were driving, she sees this young woman on the side of the road. She says to the driver, stop. For 45 minutes, she goes and she ministers on the side of the road to this young woman who had no idea who Lisa was. We don't know what she said. We don't know what she gave her. We don't know what she did. But I know now that she heard the voice of the Holy Spirit and she heard his heart for that woman because that's what's important. Not the big lunch. It's that. And that's what we can never lose sight of. You know, and you may think, but I haven't got a big platform. Wherever you are, in your family, wherever you are at school, where is the Holy Spirit taking your eyes? Go to that place. Go to that one. Go to that. We've got to let go of our agenda. We've got to let that go. You know, and, and also I think we've misunderstood what pride is, right? It's self-focus. One side of it is I think I'm wonderful and I'm very opinionated. The other side is I'm just so focused on me and my inability and my problems and my everything. They're both pride. They're both pride because pride is self-focused instead of focusing on Jesus. On Jesus. You know, C.S. Lewis said this very famous quote in, in the way that only C.S. Lewis can. And he said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. And our focus has got to be Jesus, what's on your heart. Jesus, what's on your mind. What I've realised is that the, the focus on self, particularly if you feel inadequate and you feel you've had a bad day and everything's, you know, you just feel hopeless, you spiral down. And what happens is you lose your focus. You lose your focus and the enemy is after your focus. God wants you to focus on him. You know, and then because your way out, if you're feeling dreadful, you, you know what? You have been wired to give out. Yeah. You're wired that way. Yeah. And I can tell you as a psychologist, right, if you will give out when you feel the worst, when you feel absolutely like you're in an absolute hole, give out in any way you can, something will lift off you. Something will lift off you because it's spiritual. You know, and I'm reminded of an example that absolutely rocked my world. My closest friend um, is a woman who was um, I, my offside and my husband and my offside when we were at Shakers. And they have um, a disabled son who is, has normal intelligence, but he's locked in a body that he's in a wheelchair, he has no use of his arms, his legs, he cannot speak, he cannot feed himself, he cannot do anything at all. And one day I was praying with her and she wheeled, um, wheeled Thomas in. And she said, Thomas just loves to pray. And honestly, you know, we were praying and I shut my eyes and then I just opened them. And I saw this incredibly broken body. But then I saw Jesus because he's got his eyes closed and he's praying. I'm thinking he can't give me anything, Right? He can't do anything. He's in a wheelchair. He's locked in a body that doesn't work. But what is he doing? He's praying for us. He's praying for our church. He's praying for other people. That's what humility looks like. That's what it looks like. That's what it is. And that's what we've got to find again, pick up and treasure it with everything in us. You know, and I'm all for personal testimonies because they're powerful when they proclaim what Jesus has done. But make sure that Jesus is the hero and not you. Okay, and what something that the Holy Spirit showed me and spoke to me. He said, Debbie, after you share, whether it's a testimony, whether it's preach or anything, if people come up to you and say, oh, you're fantastic, I could never do what you've done, you know, you're amazing. He said, they haven't heard from me. But if they say, oh my gosh, I feel really inspired now. Isn't God amazing? Isn't he fantastic? I feel invigorated. My faith is lifted. And I feel empowered now. Then they've heard from the Holy Spirit. We've got to remember Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the hero. Not me. Not me. You know, James 4.10 
says these words. It says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will exalt you. And my question is to where? Does that mean if I maintain a humble, a humble attitude that I will be promoted in work, in business, in ministry or whatever? And there's an element of that true, but God has something way more in mind here. Right? I want to read from Isaiah 57, 15. It says this. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit. See, humility isn't a stepping stone to what the world deems as important because we can dress up ambition in Christian clothes, right? What humility is, is an open door into a deeper place with Jesus, a deeper, more intimate place with him. That's the doorway to go into a depth where he will share his secrets with you, where he will tell you things that are just between you and him, right? And those of you who are into prayer, we don't have to tell everybody what we're praying or what God has shown us or our greatest and latest revelation. Ask the Holy Spirit what he wants us to share. You know, I was listening on the aircraft to my daughter um, has been listening to a podcast and she said, have a look at, listen to this. And I didn't know, but I listened to Francis Chan on the way over in the aircraft. And he made this phenomenal statement and it's true. He said in Matthew 6... Jesus tells us to do righteous acts in private. Pray, pray, fast and give in private. Don't let anyone else know. But then he says, confess your sins. Confess them. Tell people about your sin so that you can be healed and it can be dealt with. And we've reversed it. We've reversed it. Now we post all the great things that we do. And what do we do in secret? The sin. Right? It's got to end. It's got to end. Your greatest act of humility is to say to someone, I desperately need help. I am struggling with this. Can you please help me? Can I be accountable to you? Can you pray for me? That's what humility looks like. Right? And it's scary and it's risky because the enemy opposes it because it's your point of breakthrough. It's your point of absolute breakthrough. All right? We've got to wrap the towel of humility around every relationship that we are in. Every relationship we are in. We've got to get that picture of Jesus washing feet. You know, and um, while I was studying this, God gave me this revelation that's, again, really rocked me. Because, you know, those of you know, you know I love praying. And I was thinking, give me the example of people, someone that, you know, you're praying for, you've had an upset with some of them, your wife, your husband, your teacher, you know, your boss or someone, a close friend, and you've really had it with them. And you're praying, you know, Lord, I've had enough. I am so sick of being a doormat. I am so sick of them using and abusing me. I rebuke every foul spirit in Jesus' name that's on them, right? Nothing happens and everything gets worse. Why? Because James 3.17 says this, where there is envy or self-centeredness, right, there is every evil thing. You see, I'm praying when I pray like that from self-centeredness. It's all about me, how that person's affected me, what that person's done to me, right? When you pray from that place, you give permission for every evil thing to land in your house. But what about if you pray this? Lord... Just use me to show them how much you love them. Father, show me how I can bless them. Show me their heart. Show me how I can minister to them. I release your blessing on them. I call them into alignment with your will and plan for their life. Then you will open the door for Jesus to land in that relationship, in your home and on their life. Right? We've got to get this, people, and I'm talking to me as much as all of it because the Holy Spirit spoke to me. We're in a new season. There are new weapons. And humility is one of the new weapons. Use it. Use it. Those of you who have got you know, incredibly difficult situations you're in, very difficult, 
you know what your weapon is? I am so sorry if I've hurt you, if I've done anything. Please forgive me. Your weapon is you've got such incredible, well-mannered kids. Can you teach me? I'm missing something. Can you help me? You know, you're an incredible businessman. My business is falling apart. I don't know. Can you help me? Can you show me what I'm missing? Man, I'm really struggling with, with pornography. Can you pray for me? Can, can I be accountable to you? That's the weapon for this season. That's the weapon that will destroy what the enemy is trying to do in and through our lives. No more. No more. You know, when we apologise, don't add, the Lord told me, and I've done that myself, right? And the Lord says, why do you add that? Because I want to appear more spiritual, not completely carnal. It's, it's pride. It's absolute pride. Just say, I am so sorry. I realise, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And we do not need to defend ourselves. You know, I was in a terrible situation, and my daughter will remember it well, when I was, I'm no longer a registered psychologist, and this is why, because <laughs> I was a pastor, credentialed pastor, and a psychologist at the same time. And those of you who are psychologists thinking, are you a complete idiot or what? Yes, well, the, the inevitable happened. I was reported to the health department um, <laughs> by someone that I had given everything to. Um, but they reported me and said a whole lot of stuff that was absolute wrong and lies. And there were solicitors involved, whatever, and, and, and the advice of our solicitor before it went any further was, you've got to give your credentials up, Debbie. This is diabolical because you're not allowed to be praying for people and doing all this stuff as a psych. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's do that. But I was in the shower and I was crying. And I was saying to the Lord, I'm, I'm about to say, Lord, protect my reputation. That's what I'm saying. And the Lord stopped me and said, I made myself as no reputation for you. So, Lord, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Lord, let your name be glorified. Let me act in a way that brings honour and glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take my yoke on you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul. See, humility brings a rest. Having to prove yourself all the time to the world is exhausting. It is exhausting. And the key aspects of humility, the very key aspects are this, ruthless obedience and complete surrender of our will to the Holy Spirit. Ruthless obedience. There are some of us in this room, you know God has told you to do something. Do it. Let go of stubbornness. That was the word that God gave me. Let go. Some of us have to apologise to our children. I did. I had to. You know, I had to with my eldest daughter. I had to ask for her forgiveness because I was so controlling and manipulative as she was growing up and she rebelled. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to go and ask her to pray for you and repent to her for what you did. It changed everything. It changed everything. Ruthless surrender and obedience to the Lord is the key to humility. The other is utter dependence on him. Can I ask you guys, you know, what is your private prayer life like? What is it really like? Because if you're not praying, where are you getting your, your, your instruction from? Where are you getting it from? It's coming from somewhere. It's either coming from self or it's coming from another source. But if it's coming from the Holy Spirit, then your prayer life, you can't live without it. You won't go a day without it because you desperately need to hear him. You know, and it takes a lot of us hide behind, you know, I'm just not a brave person and we don't want to witness to our family or we, you know, this one or that one. We don't want to step out. You know what? It's pleasing people more than God, and that's pride. That's actually pride, and we've got to let it go. Yeah, they may reject us. Yeah, we might look stupid. Yeah, we might say the wrong thing. But what I've noticed is that's what the Holy Spirit rides on. He rides in on humility, not on the best presentation possible. He actually rides in on humility. And it's also intentionally considering 
others. Intentionally, intentionally. I don't have to give my opinion. I don't have to do it. I need to ask the Holy Spirit to show me, Lord, let me see their heart. Where are they coming from? Help me to understand them. And I finish with this incredibly powerful, powerful revelation that did not come from me. It came from a woman called Rayma Trainer. I was listening to. But boy, is it the word of the Lord. And it was this. If we go back to Jesus' first miracle, what was his first miracle? He was at a wedding. He was at a wedding. And what happened at the wedding? They were having a great time, but they ran out of wine. So what happens is that he was asked by his mother and he says, you know, basically he says it's not my time, but then he obeys her as every good son should. (laughs) But he says, she says, do whatever he tells you. So he tells them to fill up these jars, these, these stone jars with water. Then he turns that water into wine. Right, he turns it into wine. Then he takes it to the ma- they take it to the master of ceremonies. Master of ceremonies says this wine is better, way better than the old wine. Right? What's the symbolism? What's the message of that story for right now? What's the new wine? What is it? The new wine, right, is the new covenant we have in Jesus, but it's also the last end time pouring out of the Holy Spirit right? That's the new wine. You'll hear a lot of pastors talking about the new wine, right? Tell me what it was that was actually changed into the new wine. See, the jars of the water that were changed into the new wine were ceremonial washing jars. They were the jars, the water in that jars was used to wash feet, Anything? Do you remember anything about washing feet? Used to wash hands, right? That water in those jars was the water of humility. And that was changed into the new wine. That's what will become the new wine. That's what it is. So why am I sharing the message? Because you've already demonstrated an incredible level of humility in this house. And I know stuff has come against you. But if you embrace greater level of humility, if you embrace that, that becomes the new wine that will pour out of your spirit where you can do what you cannot do without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit.